Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Spring 2009 Law, Politics, and Media Lecture Series. This lecture series is uh, co-sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Judiciary, Politics, and the Media here at Syracuse University and the Carnegie Legal Reporting Program at the Newhouse School for Public Communications. The aim of this lecture series is to uh, introduce people to the integrated environment of legal principle, political pressure, and media coverage in which courts operate. This lecture series is part of a course on law, politics, and media uh, that the Institute for the Study of uh, Judiciary, Politics, and Media, which we call IGPM, and the Carnegie Legal Reporting Program offer each spring. Uh, this course is cross-listed between the College of Law, uh, the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, and the Newhouse, Newhouse School. It is taught by faculty associated with the uh, Carnegie Legal Reporting Program and IGPM, and it is supported, uh, this course, that is attached to this lecture series, by generous grants from the John Ben Snow Foundation and from the Carnegie Corporation. Uh, today is the first lecture in our uh, 2009 lecture series, and uh, we are fortunate uh, to be joined by Justice Harold C. of the Alabama Supreme Court, uh, the lecture he will give today is entitled, The Role of Judicial Elections in a Federal Republic. Justice uh, C. joined the Alabama Supreme Court in 1996, and during his time in that court, uh, he has witnessed firsthand uh, some of the uh, political pressure and intense media coverage uh, that uh, courts can receive. Uh, he got into the court in 1996 via judicial election. In fact, in uh, 1996, as I learned today from Justice C. himself, Associated Press uh, deemed his election in 1996 to be the nastiest election in the country that year, period, for any office. It was a highly contentious uh, series of slanderous allegations made against uh, Justice C. himself. He was at one point, I believe, portrayed as a skunk uh, in a campaign ad by his opponent. We all look for the perfect actor to play our part. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, Justice C. also served uh, on the Alabama Supreme Court uh, during the intense political controversy uh, surrounding uh, former Chief Justice Ray Moore. Uh, as some of you uh, may recall, uh, Ray Moore in the early 2000s uh, had a 5,000 pound uh, monument uh, installed in the Alabama Supreme Court building atop the monument probably display, chiseled in stone, were the Ten Commandments. Uh, Moore defied a federal court order to have uh, that monument removed, and uh, Justice C, along with seven other justices on the Supreme Court, ultimately and unanimously overruled uh, Chief Justice Moore and had the monument removed. Uh, massive protests or gatherings outside the Supreme Court building, uh, it was a big deal. Uh, what makes Justice C interesting uh, for our purposes, not only has he experienced these things firsthand, uh, but Justice C. remains, uh, uh, perhaps in spite of, perhaps as a result of these experiences, an advocate of partisan judicial elections to the bench. That's right, an advocate of partisan judicial to the elections to the bench. Uh, we're delighted to have him to here today, not only because this is a position that is uh, often more of an attack than defendant, so we will hear a thoughtful defense of this position today. But we're also delighted to have him here because Justice C. is a friend of the College of Law and of IJPM. Uh, he's lectured here at the College of Law before. Uh, he spoke at the uh, first event that IJPM put together. Actually, it was an event that IJPM put together before IJPM was IJPM in 2005, a conference on judicial independence, independence which led to the publication uh, of an edited volume called Bench Press, The Collision, of courts, politics, and the media. So it's uh, good to have you back, Justice C, and please join me in welcoming him. Uh, Professor Bobby did say one thing that, that really frightened me. He said, the spring conference. This <laughs> yes. is spring, huh? Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It remind me not to come in the winter. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm going to try to be r relatively uh, brief. Uh, I use that term, relative. Uh, you, you know the 
the story, don't you, about the the little Baptist boy and the little Catholic boy who decided to find out something about one another's religions. And and so first they went to the Catholic Church, and the Catholic boy explained to the uh, Baptist boy the what the various uh, you know what was going on, you know, what what this symbolized, what that meant, and so on and so forth. Well, the next week came. And uh, they went to the Baptist church. And the preacher got up there and he took off his watch and he set it right there in front of him. And the little Catholic boy turned to the Baptist boy and said, Now, what does that signify? And the little Baptist boy said, Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but I'll, I, I, will, I, I, I will try to keep these initial remarks brief because I, what I'd like to do is respond to the questions that you have. Uh, this this subject uh, has become uh, you know so so dense and you know so deep uh, that it that, that you really can't address everything uh, unless you're willing to stay here for a couple of days while I talk uh, and, and so what I think would be most useful is if you would ask me questions and I'll respond to those questions but let me uh, give a little bit of a backdrop a little bit of a background of, of where I'm coming from. Um, there's at present a vigorous debate about judicial elections versus judicial appointment in this case in the form uh, of what's referred to as the Missouri plan or merit selection or, or various other names. <clears throat> it's prominent now, I, I guess I'd describe it this way, it's sort of, it's a debate between the bar associations uh, and George Soros's money and right-thinking Americans versus the American electorate. Uh, voters in general, there are exceptions in some states, but in general want to elect their judges. But there are a whole lot of other folks who think that shouldn't be the case. This debate over election versus some form of appointment goes clear back to the beginning of the country. Now I'm just going to uh, blur a little bit. I, at one point I'll, I'll make a distinction, but uh, federal and, and uh, state judiciaries. But this, this debate goes clear back to the beginning uh, of our, uh, uh, well, to, our, to the adoption of our Constitution. In, in Madison's uh, Federalist Paper number 51, he feels compelled to justify not electing federal judges. So obviously, I mean, the, the presumption is people are going to be elected. He says it's impractical. He gives some reasons. But then he justifies why it's okay uh, not to elect uh, federal judges. So, so at least this is a topic that people had some concern about at that time or some interest in, although there was no such thing as election of judges uh, at that time. Well, that may not be quite true, uh, but it's close to true. Um, <clears throat> so there's this ongoing debate. Uh, in uh, in uh, the early part, or well, let me see, in the mid-1832 uh, well, to about 1912, but in the mid and, and late uh, 19th century, uh, there was a debate that was sort of the other way around. Now, we started with every state in the Union uh, appointing judges, and then that began to change. And as new states came in, between 1846 and 1912, every one of them had elected judiciaries. Uh, so we had, we had this move away from appointment to uh, uh, you know, to, to election of judges. And if you looked at the, the debate, uh, not, perhaps not the root uh, causes, but you looked at the debate, you'll see a whole lot of talk about the abuses of an appointive system. You know, talk about political hacks. You know, the judges are just political hacks. They're not qualified uh, to do the job. They're part of the machine. They're, you know, th th those sorts of things. A and so the, the rhetoric was, you know, we need to abandon that and, and, and we need to have uh, elections. Since about the, well, the, the mid to late 20th century, and it's renewed now, the debate's been the other way around. Well, you have all of these judicial elections, and look at how bad it is. Uh, there, there are problems with, uh, with all this money, uh, with ugly campaigns. Therefore, we ought to have, in this case, a modified appointment system. Uh, I, let, let me say just a word about it. Uh, it's, it's referred to either as merit selection. I trust you'll note that that's not a neutral term. Uh, 
but uh, uh, the, the, the appointive system in which there is some committee uh, that will select uh, three to five names, submit them uh, to the governor, and the governor will pick one of those names, uh, and that person you know, will, will be named the judge. Uh, there's a variation of this is being proposed right now for the appointment of federal judges, that in each of, uh, of the federal circuits there will be a committee that will pick names of those who, are, who they believe are most qualified, you know, whatever number of names, three, five names, uh, and will then submit those to the senator. Uh, so that the senator can use that as his guide. Now, obviously, under the Constitution, you can't require the senator to select one of those names. Uh, but, it's, uh, but it is a, a proposed move uh, in that direction to something analogous uh, to the Missouri plan, which is used uh, in or merit selection, uh, which is used uh, in the states. Uh, if we also, if we look back at uh, at, at this, you know, from today on, and, and look on back to the earliest days of, of this debate, you'll find lawyers played a prominent role. Lawyers have played a prominent role because, well, we're interested in that stuff, right? Uh, we feel comfortable with judges. We feel less comfortable with legislatures. I, I know people talk about all the lawyers in the legislatures. In fact, they're are relatively few, and, and in, in, the Senate, in the United States Senate, as I understand it, at least it was a few years ago, there weren't enough lawyers in the Senate to fill the Judiciary Committee, and so they had to have non-lawyers on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, but we don't feel as, as comfortable with that, and we certainly don't today. Right? I, you go to law school, and how many times do you read about what's going on in Congress or in your state legislature? It's cases, right? We study cases. We understand how courts work. We understand how judges work. We feel far more comfortable with that. And, of course, it makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it, for us to be the ones who decide who ought to be the judges. And that's something that started with the initial push for... Uh, for Missouri plan, uh, and uh, with the idea that, uh, or selling the idea that judges, know, or lawyers know judges. Lawyers are in courtrooms, lawyers deal with judges, and we're the ones that, that ought to be in a position to choose. We find today the bar associations are the ones who are pushing merit selection with a committee composed initially you know, a committee of, of the state bar, but that's been modified and, and, uh, and so there's an argument for there to be uh, citizen representatives as well as uh, representatives of, uh, of, of the bar, uh, but, uh, but still essentially bar uh, control committees to make these selections. It's easy to get caught up then in all of this rhetoric. I mean, there are real interests at stake, uh, and we can talk about uh, we can talk about those interests. But there are real interests in stake, at stake uh, as personal interests, uh, private interests at stake, in what sort of judiciary we have, and who gets to make the choice, so that we can color the judiciary in the way that we're most uh, comfortable with. And that's always been true, also. It was true of the debate in the 19th uh, century, and, uh, and, and they would trot out the examples of political hacks. It's true today, and those who have interests will trot out uh, the ugly uh, television ads. But I'd like to appeal to us to give this some serious thought and some serious analysis and not just react uh, to, uh, to the examples uh, that are trotted out. Now, I understand that's not an easy thing to do. One of my favorite quotations, and you can trace it back to H.L. Mencken, who does a variety of it, a variation on it. Uh, but one of my favorite quotations I read in a short story, probably in the Atlantic Monthly, I don't know, 40 years ago. So I, I've given up on finding uh, the, the author, so I can't attribute it to a particular name. Um, but, uh, but in the short story, the narrator says of the main character, a moment's thought would have made this obvious to him. But a moment is a long time, and thought a difficult process. <clears throat> well, you know, thinking about these things uh, isn't easy, but, uh, but, but I'd urge us to do it, because I think there are some things that are, 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 are very important, and I think we're not focused uh, on the right questions. Um, 
Hamilton in uh, Federalist 81 tells us that although there may be incidents of abuse, the judiciary is incapable of infringing on the legislature in a way that would be, quote, or in a way that would, quote, affect the order of the political system. Now he's making the point that the judiciary is the weakest of the three branches. And what he's saying is, don't get caught up in particular instances where a judge does something that has some significant effect on people, you know, something we'd like to see not happen, some, some bad example. Don't, uh, don't get caught up in that and believe that that makes the judiciary strong enough to, uh, to, to impose its will on the, uh, on, on the legislative branch. What's important to the drafters of the Constitution, to the authors of the Federalist Papers, is the structure of the government. And Madison, you know, goes, it goes to, uh, in, uh, addresses it at some length. Uh, but remember the context in which they were working. These were people who were familiar with history. They knew that representative government didn't last. It ended in tyranny. You could see it in Athens, you could see it in Sparta, you could see it in, uh, in the Italian uh, states, that when you have, you know, you, you, you have this sort of democratic government, uh, it, it becomes a representative government, power is concentrated in the hands of the representatives, and it becomes a tyranny. How do you stop that? How do you stop that concentration of power that enslaves us? You want a government that is strong enough to do for you, the things that you need done, you know, uh, defend you against uh, uh, foreign nations, foreign powers, you know, to keep the peace, uh, and, and, and various other things. Now, uh, in particular, you know, if you're looking at our Constitution, there was concern about, about free commerce, uh, uh, and, and defense uh, required some sort of taxation so that you could support uh, an army. But, you know, how do we do those things and not become the slaves of those who, who, were, who were in positions of influence, positions of power. Well, they turned to, the, to, to Montesquieu, Montesquieu's idea that we would, we would divide the power into three branches of government, right? the, the executive, the legislative, uh, and, and the judicial uh, branches of government. And by, the, by dividing the powers in that way, we could protect against, uh, uh, against a concentration of power. But it's essential that those three powers be kept separate. Now, as uh, Madison points out, you don't want to overdo that. Uh, what we're really interested in is some sort of balance of, of these powers. We're, we're not really trying to keep each branch uh, isolated from the other. There has to be a relation between the two. There is, some, there, there, there is a, a need uh, for them to relate to one another and to interact. But we, want, but we don't want the whole power of one absorbed uh, by another or its tyranny. Uh, it's hard for us to think in those terms because, of course, you know, this is 200 years into it. They didn't expect it to last this long. Uh, you remember Franklin, when he left the Constitutional Convention, was asked by a citizen, uh, what kind of government have you provided for us? And his response was, a republic if you can keep it. It sounds like a pretty pessimistic statement. It was really a practical statement, a statement uh, based on experience, that in fact uh, these things tend not to last. Well, ours has lasted a long time, uh, but if we have some faith uh, in the founders that in fact there, 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 there could be some threat to our freedom, even us, right, if we get too much concentration of power, what they designed in the Constitution, and if we don't believe them, I suppose we ought to change the Constitution, uh, but, uh, but if we have some concern about that, then we ought to be concerned about preserving that separation and balance of powers. Well, the problem that we have, and, and I just, you know, I... I, I uh, I, 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 was, I tried during uh, my 12 years on the bench uh, to make sure that we as a judiciary did not infringe on the powers of either of the other two branches. But frankly, 
uh, some of the opinions I'm most proud of, I mean, nobody else has noticed them probably, some, some of the ones I'm most proud of are ones where I defended the judicial power. Where I said, this is not something, and, and I, I, guess, I guess both, I say some, I, I think both times uh, this happened, um, we were talking about actions of the legislature that I believed were infringements uh, on the power, uh, on the judicial power. It's probably not too surprising that that happened with the legislature because, of course, uh, Madison and, and Hamilton both uh, viewed the legislative power as the greatest power. They're the ones you have trouble stopping. Well, stop and think about it. In the French Revolution, where was that power? Um, in, uh, after the Civil War, look at the Radical Republican Congress. It took over the government for all practical purposes. Uh, and that was, you know, that was the legislative uh, branch. Uh, and look, at, uh, look at the history of, of England. The king had the army. And all parliament had was the power to tax. And who won? Parliament. Right? So I, I, I think clearly that's where the power lies. Now the question is, what can we do to help the other branches? Well, we don't seem, I, I, think, I think television's done a lot to help the executive branch because it's one person. And, uh, and while I don't, uh, I, I, while I, I, I'm aware of, uh, of all the concern about an imperial presidency, I frankly think that's much less likely than an imperial congress. Um, um, but clearly, the weakest branch is the judiciary. The legislative branch has the power of the purse. The executive branch has the power of the sword. And the judicial branch has neither one. So I think what we ought to be primarily focused on, now other concerns are fine, I don't have a problem with other concerns, but I think the fundamental concern ought to be what supports the judiciary in this balance against the legislative and executive branches. And you know, in, the, in the Federalist Papers, there are a number of things that are noted. Oh, let, let me say at this point, let me make a point. You know, there's going to be a difference between federal judiciary and state, state judiciaries because there's a difference in where they are in the federal structure. Right? In, 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 the, uh, in the federal structure, why don't we uh, elect federal judges? Well... The first, uh, the first response to that is we, we don't elect federal judges because it's impractical. It's a big country. We've got 13 states. We go clear from, uh, from, from those Spanish uh, folks down in, in, in uh, Florida up to those English folks in Canada uh, and, uh, and clear across the Appalachian Mountains. And you know, that's, uh, How on earth are you going to elect federal judges for the various uh, circuits? I mean, it, it, it's too expensive. It's too inconvenient. Uh, we can't, as a practical matter, do it. Well, we could have local elections for federal judges, right? Or, we don't have to be elections, we could have local appointments. We could have the governor of New York appoint the federal judges in New York, or we could have uh, the people of New York elect the federal judges in New York. Why not? Well, the short answer is the supremacy clause. Okay? This is a government of limited authority, but in those areas where the federal government has authority, it's to be supreme. And if you have local folks in charge of the judges, there's, there's a serious risk that we're not going to have federal law be supreme. And in fact, you know, I, think, I think it's Madison who, who makes that, that point, I mean, just in passing. Um, but uh, but, but we, we've got to have some sort of national selection of federal judges if we're going to, if we're serious about having this government of limited authority be supreme in those areas in which it's granted authority. So it's got to be some national selection. You can't hold a national election for them. For crying out loud, you can't hold a national election for president, right? Because not, everybody, not everyone knows all these people. And, and so what we have to do is elect local representatives have this group that's elected get together as sort of a selection committee, 
if that sounds familiar, uh, and have that selection committee come up with who's going to be president. It, it's a Missouri plan for presidents. Right? Um, uh, but but the view was you you, know, you, you can't do that and then try, to try to do that for the for the the inferior uh, federal courts just doesn't uh, just just you know just doesn't make sense in terms of what we're attempting to do with this federal system. Uh, but we don't have that same problem with the states. Right? It, it, it's not a problem that state uh, that, that the state judiciary somehow uh, reflects the state's interests as opposed to federal interest. I mean, that's sort of what it's about. It's, it's a state judiciary. Uh, so how then, how then do we help uh, this judiciary uh, to, to play its counterbalancing role? Um, what I looked at in, in that article that those of you who are in the class uh, Larry's article, the chapter uh, that you looked at, and I won't go through all of this, uh, but I looked at three things uh, because they seem to me to be th the things that are necessary to help the judiciary in its balance against the legislative and executive pressure, to help it to be able to play uh, its role. Now, uh, you know, many of these uh, were uh, you know, some of the more of the minor ones like, uh, uh, well, the first, first requirement I said is, is independence. We need some independence. Obviously, if the, if the judiciary is answerable to the legislature or to the executive, we have a problem with, of, of, of its ability to act as a counterpoise. Uh, so we need the judiciary to be, in, to be independent. That word gets used a whole lot these days in a way that it was almost never used uh, in, the, in the Federalist Papers. And that is to say, we want judges who are free of influence from the public. Now, we can't really mean that. I mean, that it'd be easy to do. We could you know, bring all of our judges from Iraq. We could bring our judges from... You, know, you pick a country that, that's removed from the United States, and, and they're not going to be influenced by... Uh, the public, but that's not what we really mean. I mean, we, we want we want judges who are who are familiar with uh, with what our country is about, uh, uh, to familiar with our values, and so on and so forth. And they when they make their uh, decisions. But more significantly, while we may be concerned, and, and I think we are justifiably concerned, that judges not just express the popular will, because after all, judges. <laughs> at least I'd argue, are supposed to look to the law and look to the Constitution. Right? They're supposed to make their decisions based on what the law is. Well, let, uh, let, 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 let me... Uh, no, I'll go ahead. There, 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 there are two other, uh, there, there are two other uh, concerns, I, I, and, and, and let me say, while you know, we, yeah, we are concerned about that, but fundamentally we're concerned about an independent judiciary that can play its role in a tripartite system. Uh, I've, I've mentioned two other factors in that chapter. One is, is legitimacy, uh, and, and then the other is, the, is quality. We want the, you know, better judges. Uh, higher quality judges, judges who are perceived as being competent, are far more likely to be able uh, to act against the other branches than those that are less uh, qualified. Uh, the social science research, however, indicates that there's no appreciable difference depending upon the type of system, whether they're appointed or elected or, or what have you. Uh, so that doesn't seem to be a, a significant uh, factor. Uh, <clears throat> let, let me turn back for a moment then uh, to, to this... Uh, to this question of popular election. Uh, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, there, there, the, the view was expressed, I don't remember by whom now, uh, that look, he said, uh, if, if our choice has to be uh, between, uh, between the other branches uh, controlling our judges and having popular election, you know, I, I'm going to go, I choose popular election uh, regardless of, uh, uh, even, even if they do get swayed by the whims and uh, the, the will of, uh, of, of the public, a recognition of, of, of the 
fundamental role that's played by the structure of government. Uh, I used to teach. Uh, the, I used to teach the structure of government, and uh, uh, and I and I mentioned to those folks who who found uh, the uh, you know the, the the civil rights section of constitutional law far more exciting that it's all sort of irrelevant if you don't preserve this structure that gives the judiciary the power to enforce those rights. Right? Those rights don't matter if the judiciary is not able to stand up to the other two branches. If you have that consolidation of power, you, 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 know, you lose the opportunity to, to achieve that other role of civil rights. Uh, there is something else going on here. Uh, and, 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 and I think it, 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 is, it is also important for us to note. I think the Constitution compels judges to play a certain role. We have in the Constitution a structure that provides for the legislative branch to be the policy-making branch of government, to pass the laws that express the policy of, of the public. The executive branch is then supposed to carry that out. And the ultimate uh, enforcement is done by the judiciary. That ultimate enforcement means that the judiciary is supposed to carry out the will of the legislature, not the judiciary is supposed to be a substitute legislature. Right? We want separation of, of those roles. During the 20th century, uh, and I guess we call it the age of legal positivism, uh, there's been a view uh, propounded <coughs> that judges should do what's right. right? Judges should do what's right. It, 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 it's appealing. If, if, this is, if what's going on is wrong, the judge ought to write it, ought to correct it. There's another view, and I think it's the Constitution's view, that says it's the job of a judge to do what the Constitution and the law require. It's not up to the judge to say, well, yes, this is right and this is wrong. It's up to the judge to decide this is legal or this isn't legal. This is what the law requires or this is what the law requires. Uh, prohibits. Now, yeah, I have a view on that. Uh, you know, I, 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 think, I think the Constitution uh, requires that. But it's certainly possible that the Constitution allows the other. That the Constitution allows for the judiciary to exercise a policy-making role and, and I don't want to get caught up in the, well, you know, when they decide a case, they sign. I'm not talking about the little figures. I'm talking about the big issue here. Um, if, uh, that, 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 right, it, it may well be that the Constitution allows judges to make policy, to second-guess the legislature, to say, legislature, when you pass this law, you made a mistake and you should have done it this way. Uh, in fact, in, in, uh, in, in a debate I had with a, uh, an opponent in the election, we were asked what are the most difficult cases that you have to decide, and, and my opponent said, well, I, frankly, I find the most difficult ones to be those where the legislature has made a mistake and I have to correct it. Is that, that's, that's a view, it seems to me, of the Constitution, right? a view as to what the Constitution means, what it allows or encourages. Uh, and if it is, then I'd suggest to you that we have a constitutional question that needs to be resolved. So the question is, how do you resolve that question? Who is it? that ought to be making these decisions about what the Constitution allows and what it does not. We don't want, those, we don't want every issue put to a popular referendum, right? That doesn't make sense. We, we, we have courts do that. But this is a question about, uh, that, that depends upon what judges are put on the court. 
And if and, and those who decide what judges are put on the court are deciding this constitutional issue. And so what I'd suggest is that this is the very sort of thing that ought to be decided by the public. This is one of those big constitutional questions. What is the proper role of a judge? What should a judge be doing? Uh, and, uh, and, and so I would then submit to you that the way to do that is to let people decide which judges they want. Huh? They, can, they can choose between the judge who says, my job is to do what's right, and the judge who says, my job is to do what the law requires. Now, well, let, let, me, let me just end there. There, there. there are loads of things I've skipped over, uh, and, uh, and I understand that, but I think it makes sense to let you bring those up, you know, the ones I skipped over, uh, and, and, uh, and I understand that, but I think it makes sense to let you bring those up, you know, the ones I skipped over that make you uncomfortable, uh, and uh, that makes sense to you? Yeah. Sure, I just want to say that we will uh, be able to have Q&A until 5 o'clock, and then there will be a small reception outside, so we can go until 5 o'clock, and the first part of Q&A is question, and I'll ask the first question. Okay. Um, it seems like the, one of your basic arguments is the judicial elections preserve governmental structure. And the most important aspect of governmental structure that, or constitutional structure that preserve is separation of the powers. Well, what if you were to argue that judicial elections actually undermine separation of powers in the following way? Right. The framers didn't anticipate the rise of political parties. Uh, they talked about factions. Yeah, they, factions, but not parties. Right. So now we, yeah. but now we have organized political parties that are essential mm -hmm. to the way in which we, we govern. Mm -hmm. You could argue, or one could argue, um, that judicial elections subvert separation of powers, particularly partisan judicial elections, because they allow parties to get governing majorities across all three branches. So you have Republicans controlling the presidency, Congress, and the judiciary. So because of the advent of, I guess, let's keep it at the state level, because of the advent of elections, uh, we could actually have voters staffing all three branches mm -hmm. with members of the same party. And because they're members of the same party, we get coordination across the three branches rather than checking and balancing. And remember, the, the framers were pretty skeptical of, of voters. I mean, they didn't think that uh, they had a... If they were passionate and self-interested, and right. you know, right. we have elections, but uh, they also thought that we should do all kinds of things to limit the participation and choice that uh, people would well, have. Well, yeah, yeah, actually, to limit the the immediacy, right? That, and and what that would argue for probably is is certainly staggered terms for judges and perhaps longer terms for judges. Um, yeah, I, 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 and that that in fact that that very argument. Uh, uh, was made with respect to the move into elections. But the problem with the argument is, let, 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 remember what the choice is. The choice is, is between elections and some sort of appointment. If you can control the elected branches, what makes you think you can't appoint people that are your party, that share your interests? And in fact, isn't that a more sure way to do it? Because you can, never, you can never be certain about every election, but by golly, if I can get a majority in Congress or in the legislature, and I can get a majority uh, in the executive, well, you know, actually, the easiest thing is if I think I can get the governor elected, have him be appointing the judges. Now I've got a way to get my party in control of the judiciary. If I let the people vote, they might not vote for the person I'd like, if you've got the legislature. But, but, you know, it, but it, it seems to me it just... It, 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 uh, it, it misses the fundamental point that 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 you know once you once you control uh, the elected branches and you can appoint you've got control of the judiciary. If you got to get them elected, well, maybe maybe not. Okay. Yes. Um, I have two questions. You mentioned that the three things that you, from the chapter that you took were right. independent. Yeah, and I just sort of skipped over those, but I figured you read them, so. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I have a question. In terms of legitimacy, um, do you think that the arguably heightened appearance of impropriety or quid pro quo actually diminishes the legitimacy of the judicial branch, even with elected uh, 
election. Can, can you elaborate just a little so, bit? So, um, you know, we read actually last last class of cases in West Virginia that re ah, regarded the yeah, um, yeah. Uh, whether a judge should recuse himself and right. whether the, that partisan election actually yeah. uh, diminishes the legitimacy of the of the court and its duty because yeah. of the the appearance of impropriety, whether or not. It's yeah, I, I think I think there's influence both ways. I think it, it has some influence both ways. Certainly. If you well, suppose you had an appointed judge, and 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 and, and we can find examples of that too. You, if you take appointed judges who've taken bribes, that diminishes the legitimacy of the judicial branch. Uh, this is a judge who, arguably, I, I guess, I'm trying to think of the. I'm, I'm trying to remember all all the facts in that case, but. Um, but uh, but uh, there was this. Uh, I know there was a lot of money in, uh, spent to get him elected, and then he he did not recuse. Uh, I can't remember. Was was there? There were also allegations of personal gain, though, weren't there? Yeah. And 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 so yeah, that's that. I mean, that, that's always going to hurt the judiciary. However, the the judges uh, are selected. Does the fact that there are campaign contributions to judges? Uh, cause people to to have question, and the answer that's yes, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think that I think that is a a problem with respect to legitimacy. On the other hand, when people elect the judge, they have some confidence in that judge, and they have some stake in that judge. And that also, I mean, that also enhances legitimacy. Now, we can with appointment we can remove all of that appearance because we hide it. We know that there were a whole lot of folks at work on each side either to get or to stop Clarence Thomas from being elected, or appointed, I'm sorry, uh, from being appointed. We know that's going on. We know that in a, in a, in a state system with, with, a, with a committee, there's politics involved. I mean, I've talked to people who come out of systems where, where, where there's a committee that selects the candidates, or selects three names, and the governor picks one name. Uh, and, 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 the, and they say, you, you know, you've, got to, you've got to be right politically. Uh, maybe, in some cases, it's just flat out political party. In other cases, it's what part of the bar association. Are you in with the, with the right crowd in the bar association? Yeah. I mean, you know, politics is what is how people function, and how they relate to one another, what they do, and, and, and there's politics involved in that. And there may well be a lot of. I mean, if it is worth two million dollars to get somebody appointed to some interest group, it's worth two million dollars. I'm sorry, to get them elected, and they'll invest two million dollars in an election and get them elected. Why is it worth nothing to get them appointed? The answer is, it's worth $2 million to get them appointed, right? The $2 million may not show up in the same way. It may be, uh, Governor, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to contribute $100,000 to your campaign. Uh, but, you know, I'm concerned about the judges. And it sure would mean a lot to me if you just, you know, let me have a say. Uh, in, in, in who's uh, going on the bench and who you're appointing. It may go that way. Um, and it may not, and, and you know, we have to be careful how they, I mean, they have to be careful how they phrase it or who they go through or, you know. But the money's going to show up, isn't it? Aren't you going to invest in getting your folks on the committee that's going to make the selection? If it's worth $2 million, aren't you going to do something to make sure your folks are sitting on that committee? That's people who think like you do. You know, our kind of people. Aren't you going to do that? That undermines it too, of course, if we can keep it hidden, if we can paper over it, and nobody ever finds out about what's going on, then I guess they'll have more confidence in the judiciary. But I've got a problem with that. The reason we know about that judge in West Virginia is because it was an election. And there were campaign finance reports that had to be filed. And as a result, we could see what was going on. It opened it up to daylight. I believe in sunshine. Right? I believe in daylight. I believe in opening government up, not closing it up. And I don't think that the judiciary is somehow different. And that we shouldn't know how we get judges. 
Because heaven forbid, if we know, we'll lose confidence. Isn't it better to say, hey, I don't like what's going on, to be able to see it and say, I don't like the way it's being done, and I'd like to do something to change it. Yeah, oh, uh, well, I'll come back to you. All right, go ahead. Okay. Um, based on the grounds that the way people in the legal profession understands the law and the issues versus those who are not, yeah. what happens when the majority of people want the judge to do something that is absolutely illegal? Uh, yeah. so that when that clashes, what should be what should be the result? Well, the result is the judge should do what do what the law requires, right? I, uh, I, I actually, I actually uh, had that question uh, presented to me in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, it may be in the chapter, so I, I don't mean to bore people, but um, it's in, unintentional. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, that someone, uh, an appellate court judge, uh, uh, told me about a trial court judge who said to her, look, I decided that case the wrong way. I mean, I know that's not the law. I decided it that way uh, because I'm up for election. And so I'm just going to let you reverse me. Of course, I mean, she ultimately stood for election too, but she stood for statewide election. And she said, I don't want to see that happening. Therefore, we should not have elected judges. I, 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 have, I have two responses to that. And the first one is, that's not a problem with elections. That's a problem of character. Right? I, we, have, we, we had a trial court judge in Alabama. And he was, and, and, the, uh, and the, 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 there's a case called Scottsboro Boys. Depression era, Alabama. A group of, uh, I'm trying to remember, eight, I think, uh, eight or 12, uh, young black men uh, needed work. And they got on a train and or riding because they heard about a job someplace. There were two white, young white women on the train, and they claimed they were raped by these African-American boys. And so they were tried. They had a lawyer who was drunk through most of the trial, and the U.S. Supreme Court reversed their convictions. They were then retried, and there was a judge in Alabama, a trial court judge, elected judge, who got that case. And the evidence was presented and went through it all the way, and, uh, and, and the jury, all white male jury, uh, the jury uh, found him guilty and, as I recall, imposed a death sentence on him. Went to the judge, and the judge was considering it. And the judge was told, if you don't uphold that conviction, you will not be reelected next year. The judge thought about it and he looked at the case and he said, this is, this is based on perjured testimony. So I can't uphold this. Let me mention it. His father had been a slave owner. And so he reversed it. And he was not elected, not reelected the next year. But there's a difference between him and that other trial court judge I was telling you about. And that is, he had character. He did his job. Huh? He looked at what his job was and what his responsibility was to the Constitution and to the law, and he did it, and he paid the price. There will always be a reason to do what's popular instead of what you're required to do. There will always be a reason. It may be so you get along well with your in-laws. It may be so that the folks at the country club think well of you. There is always a reason. So that the newspapers will write nice editorials about what a great judge you are. There are always reasons. And the question is, do you have character or not? Uh, yeah, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me take it another step. And that is, I don't think the people are as incompetent to run their country, as a lot of people seem to think they are. People say, look, judges are different. Judges are different. And, and, and the people don't understand a judge's job. Look, school board superintendent is different. Attorney general is different. Governor is different. Representative, they're all different. They're different jobs that they're supposed to do. We expect different things of them. 
The public seems to be capable of understanding those differences. If it isn't, we have a bigger problem. If the public can't understand that, then, then democracy is out the window. I mean, it, it's just a matter of time. It's gone. We are incapable of self-government. But I don't think that's true. They can make those distinctions. And I don't see any reason why they can't, for some magical reason, understand the difference when it comes to judges. And we'd like to think that because we went through three years of law school. And, you know, but, but in fact, you know, when I talk to them, I think the public understands the role that a judge is supposed to play. I have, not, I have, I have made unpopular decisions. And... And, and voters out there, that doesn't, they, 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 don't, they, sti they, they still don't think I'm right. right. But they forgive me because they understand. The judge is supposed to follow the law. And I may not like that decision, but I believe he follows the law. And I'm going to overlook this. Right? This letting some some guy off at death row and, and going and retrying it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I had a case in, in, which, uh, in which I removed, a, I, I mean, I was, one, I was the one of five votes, uh, that removed a child from some adoptive parents, gave it back to the, to, to, to the father, to the birth father. Uh, I think there was plenty done wrong in that case. You know, I had to make that decision. It was a tough decision. A lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people didn't like it. But that I was real life. If I'm, just very quickly, I agree with what you're saying about character, but I guess my concern is it, I mean, even the example that you gave, it seems that the person, the judge with character didn't get reelected, and yeah. the judge without character did get reelected. That's but, true. So That's true. wouldn't yeah. we want the opposite of that? We want the judge with we character. We would love the opposite of that, and you know who ought to be that? <clears throat> The, the, newspapers. the newspapers, uh -huh. the newspapers, the newspapers ought to talk about that. That's right. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, yeah, and and and, and yeah. I, 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 let me say, I think one of the big things we need, even though I believe the public generally understands what it is that that judges are supposed to do and, and looks to that, um, and, and well. I think one of the big things we need is public education. Public education about what it is the courts do, what it is the judges do, you know, why, why these things are important. Uh, that, yeah, I think we need to do that. Uh, with the, uh, I, the principal people ought to do it are judges. One nice thing, as I've said to a group of federal judges, one nice thing about being elected is at least every, once every six years I get out and talk to people. Right? And they get to see something, to learn something about a judge. Uh, federal judges generally, you know, they're not in a position where where they where they are required to do that, and they typically don't. Um, but uh, but I think judges have that obligation. I think we ought to get out more than once every six years. We ought to be getting out all the time. We ought to be talking to people about what the role of the courts is, what the role of judges is. I think lawyers secondarily have an obligation uh, to do that, and that tends to happen on law day, you know. But it ought to happen year round. Um, and and I think I think uh, I think the media I, I would say newspapers but that may only last for another four or five months right yeah. uh, but the news media ought, ought to uh, uh, get out there and, 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 and play that role and, and the schools I, I'm I, I'm I'm troubled that I think schools are not educating uh, young folks about the nature of government uh, in the way that they did 50 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Having gone through two ca a couple of campaigns, how do you think the media did portraying your election races? Well, of course, uh, in large measure, they did exactly what I wanted because I paid them. Right. And, you know, that, that's why you have. That's why you have to have paid uh, uh, advertising. You know, that's why it requires money. I, I, I would love to be able to go to a television station and say, "Hey, just give me half an hour to talk, you know, or fifteen minutes." Or 30 seconds. You know, just give it to me. And have them all, all say, oh yeah, we want people to know, and we're going to invite the candidates in, and we're going to give away uh, you know, four hours a day. Uh, of course, if they did, it'd probably be from 1 a.m. But, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, but I actually made that proposal to a newspaper editor one time, uh, and, uh, and, and he told me I, that, that you know, he'd love to do it, but you have to talk to the advertising department or, the, or whoever, you know, the, the money folks. Uh, but uh, but yeah. So to to I mean you know to the extent that you're willing to pay for it, you know you you get your message out. Uh, then beyond that, 
it, uh, oh gosh, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, we all would like more. I was pretty high profile race, and so I got a fair amount of coverage. But folks for the court, the lower, the mid, middle court, you know, the Court of Appeals, uh, they got almost none. I mean, they, they, do, they do get to write a little column. Uh, about themselves, and it gets published, you know, the week or so before uh, the election, and that helps. I mean, and I, I, I don't want to play that down. That, in fact, uh, for many offices, that's largely what I go on, except that I know all these people now. Uh, but, uh, uh, and, and then I guess the other, you know, I, I, I get. I, I think most of the newspapers, you know, try to do a, a, a reasonably fair job. Uh, and I understand, I mean, you have to look at that from the standpoint of, well, you know, I know I'm better than they think I am. So you, you might not be entirely happy with the, the coverage, but I think, you know, by and large, it's, it's, it's pretty decent coverage. I, I only remember uh, one reporter who, who, <laughs> who, who put quotes, quotations in my mouth. He would ask me questions, and, and, and I'd say yes or no, and then the statement that he made the question into, he puts quotation marks around. I never, never dealt with him again. Uh, there was, there, there, there's also one newspaper in, in Alabama uh, that I, I think you know, used to be a very good newspaper, but but I think now is kind of carried away with subjective uh, reporting, uh, and uh, you know, so I'm troubled by them. But yeah, by and large. Uh, yeah, and because you don't get nearly as much television coverage as you do newspaper coverage, because Television is more expensive, and they have a little harder time giving it away. Um, uh, that, uh, I, I guess that's the best I can do with that answer. Uh, yes, and, and I'm not forgetting you. We'll come back. Okay, yes. Um, you spoke about the two uh, potential roles of the judiciary, and either second-guessing the legislature or sort of upholding their will. Um, do you think that allowing voters to decide the answer to that question on a fairly regular basis could ultimately lead to some inconsistencies in how um, our cases are decided? And does that present a problem? Well, of course, I, I, I've taken enough tests that I know, and, you know, true false tests that I know, what, you know, could it possibly, the answer is always yes. <laughs> right. True. <laughs> would, would that be a big problem to people that are trying to look to the law for some consistency to sort of um, you know, see how their situation might apply. That, that I, I don't see that as a real problem. I assume what you're saying is this year they might feel one role and the next yeah, year another role. Exactly. Yeah, but, but, but if, if that's going to happen, I think it's going to happen over, over, over much longer periods of time. And I would hope it wouldn't. I mean, you know, but, you know, but, you know, I, but I hope the answer would be that the Constitution means what it says because I'm, I'm worried about uh, I, I'm worried about the legislative and judicial functions becoming merged and let, let me say I'm not worried about it in the way Brutus uh, describes it uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm more well actually maybe the way he describes it not the way he characterizes it um, what, what worries me more is the tendency of the legislature to rely when it can upon the judiciary to say uh, well, we uh, you know, we don't want to we, we don't want to say this, uh, or we don't want to take this position, but we'll we'll set things up so the judges can take that that unpopular position, and in that way we can get what we want done, and and that's uh, you know, I, I, I think I think that's more the nature of the threat. The two of them working together, and, and judges, you know, <laughs> your first impulse is, is is yes, I'd like to do this. Gosh, you know, federal judge, would you like to run a school system in Kansas City? I'd love it. Right? But I think there's a problem with separation of power. Yeah, go ahead. Well, do you have any uh, opinion as far as, like, um, states or anything putting restrictions on, like, topics judges can talk about during, like, uh, election campaigns? I mean, I mean, obviously, on one side you have First Amendment considerations, and on the other side, you know, it's... It's scary sometimes to hear, you know, if people right. want to talk about hot button issues, and uh, you know, it's hard to because you don't even know, you know, the facts of a hypothetical case or something. So yeah. it's kind of hard to give an opinion on it. Right. Yeah. No. I. I. I no. I. I. 
I do not favor restriction of what the judge can say. I do, however, favor recusal. That is, you know, I, I, I can say, you know, you, you elect me, and I will decide in favor of Joe Jones in that case that, that, that the newspapers are reporting about. I can say that, but once I say it, I can't decide the case. And then, as his opponent, I can say, he tells you he'll do that, but he won't do it, and let me tell you why. He's required to recuse. Yeah, I think, I think if, there's, you know, if, if there's bias, and when I say I'm going to decide a certain way, clearly there's bias. Now, you have to decide where the recusal line uh, gets drawn, but, but, but I guess the answer to the question is, no, I don't favor restriction. I don't favor prior restraints on, on speech by judges. I have serious questions as to whether that would be permissible. Um, uh, but I do favor recusal. I mean, I don't, I don't think judges ought to be deciding. I don't think judges ought to be sitting on cases they've already decided. So you think there's like, I mean, if the judge comes out and is talking about something, something, something with child molesters, you know, before, uh, during his campaign process, and then, you know, once he gets that case come, uh, comes up, while he's, he wins the election, comes a judge in the case. Well, well we, we, did, we did have a case in which uh, uh, one, one of the can judicial candidates had made a statement about, uh, about uh, I'm trying to remember the exact nature of it, but, but the, the gist of it was uh, that criminals ought to be prosecuted. And then this guy said, well, well, then she has to recuse because I, I'm, I'm defending myself in a criminal case. And so she's biased against me. And, and I'm, I, no, I think she's biased in favor of the law. And we're, oh, it's okay for us to have a bias in favor of the law. You know, do, do, do you, uh, do, do you uh, no, we were frequently asked, do we believe the Alabama Constitution should be uh, revised, have a new constitution? We have what is like, purported to be the longest in the world uh, because everything, the, 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 the 1901 Constitutional Convention wanted to concentrate power in the legislature, you know, and, and as a result, just about anything you want to do requires a constitutional amendment. And so there are, I don't know, last count, I think like 800 uh, amendments. And so you put it all together, it makes for an enormously long uh, constitution. Uh, and, and it seems to me, you know, whether I'm for it or against it is really sort of irrelevant to the question of whether when a case comes before me, I'm going to apply it. Well, of course I'm going to apply it. I might, I might think it ought to be amended. In fact, I do. I mean, I'm not amended, but, you know, redone. Now, I want to know who's going to redo it. Before I, you know, uh, before I support that particular re revision effort, uh, but I believe it needs to be revised. I mean, there, there are things in there from from the days of segregation that are you know, no longer effective, but they ought to be removed. Uh, so, yeah, I'm 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 in favor of that. Does that mean when somebody uh, raises some constitutional issue, I have to recuse? No. And so, yeah, you know, let, let me go on record as saying I don't like child molesters. Does that mean I can't decide a child molestation case? I've got to be neutral? Well, you know, some people say child molesting is good. And some say, it's good. yeah, no, I, I can be in favor of the law and not have to recuse. Yeah. Yes. Um, one of the, the major points that you make is that. Um, the public maybe doesn't understand, or that there needs to be more information about the role of the judiciary. Yeah, now, 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 I, wait, you understand. I, I, I start out, I say the public does understand, but I, I, think, I think we're not educating children sufficiently, and I think, I think we, need to, we need to have that sort of public debate. Remember, the Federalist Papers were in newspaper articles, right? And, and I mean, this is public discourse. And I think we ought to have this kind of public discourse. Right, but I, I actually don't think that the problem that people have with judicial elections is that people don't understand the role of the judiciary. It's that they don't necessarily know enough about the difference between the candidates. And in, in the article that you have in the book, you say, well, you know, people don't know a lot about their state assemblyman right. or state right. representatives. But yeah. that, to me, doesn't really seem analogous because those are necessarily political people. So if voters don't know about that much about the difference between state assemblymen, they can appropriately vote for a party that they more closely identify with. So it seems to me that for people to better understand the difference between judicial candidates, there necessarily needs to be better information out there, which requires more money. Do you see a way for there to 
I mean, is there another way for judicial candidates in public elections um, to get better name recognition or more information about their legal, you know, beliefs than other than, you know, increasing the cost of judicial elections? Yeah, well, information is expensive, uh, and, 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 but I think there, it depends on the situation. There are a number of answers. Uh, first of all, if it's a local judgeship, you know, that's, that's largely done by meeting people. You know, you can go to every house in, in, a, in the community uh, or in, the, in a small or relatively uh, small judicial district. So, so it's the statewide elections that are the problem. Uh, when you're talking about, uh, in our case, courts of appeals, although uh, your uh, appellate division, uh, I don't know if they're by district or, or, or statewide, but but anyway, uh, you know, if, if when it's when it's by district, then then yeah, you can you can substitute hard work for money, but when you get to a statewide level, you now you know, ours is not that big a state, but still, it's four and a half million people. Uh, and if you figure, I mean, if, if only, you know, if that four and a half, if only two million of them are voting age, you still, you know, I did the math on this at one point, and I don't remember, uh, but, but as I recall, if they, if they wouldn't die and no new ones would be born, uh, I think uh, I, I, I still would be a couple elections away if they'd just line up and give me ten seconds each to shake hands. I mean, you, you just, you can't get to that many people, that many houses in a statewide election. So that costs money. Now, the internet, I think, is a, is a relatively inexpensive way that's making a difference. There's still a lot of people who aren't familiar with the internet, but you, the, way you, the way you run an election is you get people who represent you. So that, for example, in 1996, when, that, when those ads were being run about me, and, and you know, I, I, they're just, just one thing after another, uh, when those ads uh, were being run, what made the difference, the reason, well, there were two things that made the difference. One was I had press conferences up and down the state. That cost some money because you've got to get there. Um, but, uh, but, 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 you know, that was one thing. The other thing was that when folks went to, I don't know, the grocery store and they saw some friend of theirs or they went to church and they're sitting next to somebody in the pew or uh, they go to the, the club meeting and, and, and they're talking to other people and someone would say, did you, did you see uh, about Harold C. and he, you know, whatever it is, um, that the other person would say, uh-uh, I don't believe that. I know Harold C. and he's not like that. But you do that by knowing people by, by going and meeting people, not going costs something too. I mean, you, you, it costs gasoline, so so it's 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 not free. But you certainly, you know, I mean, you certainly can do those things that help. But but if 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 you're looking for the the you know the the cure all uh, to to this problem of information requiring money, I I yeah, it, it's going to cost money. And, when, and, and frankly, I think a downside of, uh, of popular election is that perception that comes that when people are giving money, the judge is, 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 going, to, uh, is going to favor them. I say perception because I've never seen it uh, to be true, uh, but, uh, but there is that perception. And I, I'd refer you back then to the, to the earlier answer, which says, well, we can hide it. We can hide the money. Uh, does that does that make it better? No, I don't think so. I think we've got the same problem. I, I, yeah, what was it? I, I, I saw an estimate that something like fifteen million dollars was spent on the appointments of Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Alito. Relatively non-controversial appointments. I mean, it wasn't a Bork or or a Clarence Thomas appointment, right? I mean, these are people that everybody more or less agreed. Yeah, they're they're, they're qualified to be on the Supreme Court, and still. Some fourteen or fifteen million dollars spent just on television in their confirmation process—an enormous amount of money. Uh, you know, we don't we don't we don't get that out. But uh, but anyway, I don't know. Did I? It, it, if I didn't answer your question, tell me. Well, kind of. Um, I mean, but the the money that goes towards appointing, you know, getting a judge yeah. appointed, doesn't go directly to the judge's campaign fund, whereby they know who is giving it to the, I mean, you know, who's giving Oh, you giving think money. you're going to give two million dollars and they're not going to know? I'm, I'm just saying that the appearance, the appearance of, I agree. of campaigns. I agree. If you can keep it hidden. 
as long as there's no investigative reporter who shows that this was going on behind closed doors, in which case it will even further uh, impact but the, but the thing is, I mean, when, um, you know, when, um, you know, Planned Parenthood put out an ad against, um, yeah. you know, the appointees, it's not like, it's not like the, the you know, justices asked them to do that or, or, you know, or if they did something, if there was someone who put an ad out in favor, it's not like they asked them to do it or really thought that was a positive thing for them well, to do. It's just that these, these groups decided to do it rather than groups yeah. giving to a campaign fund. I think well, it's different. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes and no. You may want to do an internship in Washington, D.C. I worked there for years. <laughs> okay, well, uh, you know, there, 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 there probably was coordination on both sides. Uh, and, 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 and I suspect that, uh, that the justices know full well you know, who it is that was on both sides. Uh, I don't think that affects their votes because I think their view is that they ought to be interpreting the Constitution, interpreting the law, and they're going to do that. And, 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 and from personal experience, on both sides, I mean, Democrats and Republicans that I've served with on the court, I, I, I don't believe they're influenced by that. Now, that doesn't change the fact that a lot of voters out there think so, and that's a negative. I mean, that, 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 you know, that, that, that clearly is a negative. Is that a sufficient reason to opt for one of the others? I think not. I think you want to look at all of the factors. I think you want to, and I think you want to bear in mind what it is we're trying to do with the three branches of government. And, and, and how we're trying to uh, trying to keep that, that separation and balance of powers in there. Right. Okay, go ahead and ask. Oh, I'm sorry. We're actually, unfortunately, you're going to have to. It's not my fault. I <laughs> I tried. This is really just a break uh, discussion, uh, for two purposes. Uh, one, so I can actually three purposes. Uh, one, so I can present uh, just see with a token of our appreciation. Oh, well, in, in which case, I'm all in favor of the break. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Appreciate you very that. much. And the third purpose is just to ask you to join me once again in thanking Justice Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.